In this video, I will be discussing the locality problem of quantum mechanics, which is the problem that you can have things happen instantaneously rather than having to be sort of propagated through space and time at the speed of light. And so say we have another single slit diffraction experiment, but this time we have a semicircular detector that is placed a long way away from the split. And uh, we can also say that there is a vacuum inside of here. Uh, and so this is the thought experiment that uh, Einstein came up with at the uh, Solvay conference in 1927. And so we have a setup that looks like this. So this is our electron coming in as a plane wave. When it comes through the slit here, it becomes a Gaussian wave packet, which will then spread out into this chamber here that has a detector making a semicircle uh, around that way so that the the uh, spreading out Gaussian wave could sort of impinge on any part of this detector here. So indeed we could make the distance arbitrarily large so we could make the sort of uh, radius of this semicircle arbitrarily large in our thought experiment but it's not really necessary so let's just say for the sake of argument that it's a hundred meter radius so it's a hundred meters from here all the way to uh, one end like that so we send our single electron through at the slit and it goes through so it creates this diffraction wave so when the particle hits the detector its wave function will collapse uh, but the semicircle is extremely accurately measured, so the wave should reach the detector at the same time in every direction. So the wave that's going in this direction will hit the will hit this at the same exact time that the wave in this direction will hit right there on the detector. Uh, yet we will see only a single detection. What this means is that when the particle reached the screen, it collapsed and decided which part of the detector screen it will hit. And instantaneously, the entire wave function knew about this. So in other words, uh, let's say we have the electron uh, hits the screen somewhere far up near the top. So at this blue part right here, then the wave function down here knows immediately and by that I mean instantaneously, the detector was hit up here, and so it knows not to also show a detection down here. So if it were the case that information had to travel through the wave function at the speed of light, so that information from the hit at the blue spot, that the blue dot propagated outward at the speed of light, so it hits up here, and then the information that it hit up there would have to sort of move through here at the speed of light right here, uh, then there would be a delay and we might expect to see hits elsewhere uh, from the same particle on the detector, but this is not what happens. Uh, and so Heisen, or Einstein, Heisenberg, and de Broglie all came up with uh, similar thought experiments sort of later on in their lives. Uh, so Heisenberg's way of conceptualizing it has sort of the benefit of actually being able to be an experimental setup. And so I'll talk about his first here. So what we do is we have a half silvered mirror. So half of all photons will transmit and half will reflect but there's no way to predict which will do which. So it's just a one-half probability of transmitting and one-half of reflecting. And so we fire a photon at it. You have detectors some distance away, but equally distant from the half-silvered mirror. And so we have an experimental setup that looks like this. So this is our, uh, I guess, laser here that's uh, firing this photon. And this is our half silver mirror. And so there is a 50% chance that it will transmit and a 50% chance that it will reflect. And then we have these detectors here. So upon the de 
uh, detecting the photon, say, the detector for the reflected mirror, so that would be this one right here, then you would instantaneously know that it was not transmitted since the wave function collapses on this detector right here. All right, so the one by Einstein and uh, de Broglie are very similar, and they go something like this. So you put a particle into a box and let it sit for a while so that the wave function sort of spreads out throughout the entire box. Uh, you then quickly insert a divider, dividing the box into A and B. So we have uh, something that looks like this. So we have this particle in a box which has this wave function right here. Then we put this divider into it so that we end up with half A and half B here. Uh, so without looking into either of them, the two halves of the box are then separated and transported far away from one another. So uh, I think it's in I don't remember which one. It might be De Broly's where he said, you know, you send one to Paris and one to Tokyo. And so we have our two half boxes here. So the wave function will sort of uh, split like this so that it's sort of a 50% chance in here and a 50% chance in there. We then separate the boxes and say this one goes to Paris and this one to Tokyo. All right, so there are now two options. Uh, so it's either the case that the particle is definitely in box A or it is definitely in box B. The probability applied to each being one half is merely a reflection of our ignorance, not something true about the particle. So it is sort of definitely in here and we just don't know about it because we haven't looked at it yet or it's definitely in here and we don't know that because we haven't looked into it yet and so this 50 50 chance is just uh sort of our ignorance about uh about what which box which half of the box the particle is in so the other option is that the particle is in some sense half in box A and half in box B. Uh, but upon examining the contents uh, of, say, box A in Tokyo, the particle instantaneously collapses to being either in box A in, uh, in Paris or box B in Tokyo. So the second one, both Einstein and de Broglie say, violate special relativity because uh, you are sort of collapsing the wave function in box A, but it's also instantaneously collapsing the wave function in box B in Tokyo. So we can put this in the Bell conceptualization that I discussed in a previous video. So we can look at the figure here. So we have the, uh, the wave function in the left part of the box and the wave function in the right part of the box. So these are the past light cones for events A and B that correspond to the examination of the left side of the box and the right side of the box. So this is examining the left side, say, in Paris, and this is examining the right side, say, in Tokyo. So if the particle was found in the left half box, we'll call this A equals plus 1, and if it the left half box is empty, it's A equals 0. Uh, likewise, if it's in... Uh, if it's in the right half box, then B is plus 1, and if it's in the left, then B is equal to 0. So the quantum mechanical wave function will then be this. So it's just this superposition of these two uh, wave functions here, where each half of the box contains 50% of the total probability, and so when we square each of these, we get one half for them. And so the sigma, so the sort of slice of space-time that, uh, that has all of the information that sort of determines what would happen, say, here at A, uh, we can look at this horizontal line right here. Uh, so our sigma will be that horizontal line in the past light cone of A, which specifies all the events, which contains the uh, psi sub L, so the left half of the box, and all the physical details about the transportation of the box, the observer, the particle detector, and so everything, everything that is happening here at event A uh, is determined by the, you know, this sort of slice here in space-time behind it, which contains sort of all of the relevant information for it. So according to quantum theory, 
there is still just a 50% probability assigned to our uh, our particle being in the left half of the box. And so in that Bell formalization I discussed in an earlier video, that would be the probability of A being equal to plus 1 given this uh, this sort of complete specification of all events in that space-time slice is equal to half. But we also have that event B will change this outcome. So in fact, the probability that it's in the left half of the box, given that entire uh, space-time slice, the specification of all events in that space-time slice, and that B was found in the right half of the box, then this probability of, of the particle being in the left half of the box will be equal to zero. And so we see that this right here is not equal to this right here which uh, those two things being equal was the sort of Bell conceptualization of what it meant for something to be local. And so in other words, the probability of finding the particle in the left half box is zero given that the particle was found in the right half box. So similarly, the probability that it's found in the left half box is going to be 100% uh, given that it was not found in the right half box. And so we obtain a violation of Bell's locality condition, that these two things have to be equal to each other. And we also get a violation of the modification. Uh, and so uh, our B here, so say this is finding it in, in the right half, and this is not finding it in the right half. So the probability of finding it in the left half, given that we found in the right half, is zero. And the probability of finding it in the left half, given that we didn't find it in the right half, is one. And so these two things are not equal to each other. And so we are violating the uh, sort of modification on the Bell's locality condition. So the upshot of this is that if we take the wave function as representing something real and complete, about the world, uh, then the collapse of the wave fun function violates locality. So we therefore have a dilemma between locality and completeness. So if we accept locality, then we must accept that the wave function is an incomplete description of the quantum system. There has to be some kind of hidden variable that explains why you get this at least seemingly instantaneous collapse of the wave function at some arbitrary distance away when you sort of examine the particle uh, close to you. But if we accept completeness, if we say that the wave function is a complete description of the system, uh, then we ha must accept that locality and special relativity are, can be violated, so that it's possible to violate uh, locality and special relativity. So this is kind of the uh, you know the main thrust of what Einstein was worried about. Uh, a lot of people, including Niels Bohr and including uh, uh, Podolsky, who wrote the EPR paper, seemed to mistake Einstein's sort of misgivings about about quantum mechanics as being about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But Einstein's biggest thing was this locality, uh, this locality issue. So between locality and completeness, because Einstein was in favor of locality. And so he said that we have to accept that the wave function is an incomplete description of the quantum system, that there has to be some kind of hidden variables. Uh, so both Einstein and Schrodinger were, uh, were proponents of accepting locality and therefore saying the wave function was incomplete. Uh, so with Niels Bohr, his position on this was, as we will see in later videos, was a bit unclear. Uh, he seemed to want to uh, kind of have both of these things be true. He seemed to want to keep locality, but also say that the wave function was complete, but he seemed to think that completeness meant something more epistemological than ontological. Uh, but anyway, uh, so, I mean, 
the sort of, I guess, canonical or orthodox way of thinking about this is that we have to accept completeness, especially given the experiments on Bell's inequality, which uh, I've discussed in my sort of standard quantum mechanics playlist, but uh, I'll also be talking about more in this video series as well. But uh, the sort of orthodoxy uh, you know, to this day, at least as I'm recording this, is that we have to accept completeness, and therefore we have to say that locality can be violated, that uh, we are allowed to violate locality and special relativity in these cases of quantum mechanics. Uh, but anyway, this is the sort of dilemma that we have between locality and completeness. Uh, like I said, Einstein was uh, often kind of misinterpreted by his opponents on this, including Niels Bohr, who all seemed to think that Einstein's problem had more to do with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. But this is kind of the big thing that that Einstein and Schrodinger were both uh, were both very uh, wary of was this. Uh, this dilemma right here, where, like I said, they were proponents of uh, accepting locality and therefore saying quantum mechanics was incomplete. But anyway, I'm kind of repeating myself here. Uh, I hope you found this video interesting, and I will see you in the next one.